Hi everyone, welcome to our fourth webinar, uh, part of our Reducing the Environmental Impact of Roads Through Planning and Design. I'm Erin, I'm your host for the series. Now, we're going to go through this introduction uh, relatively quickly because we have an action-packed hour and a half of content for you. As we've discussed in parts, you know, one, two, and three, uh, properly managing the interception, accumulation, and redirection of water is imperative to minimize your environmental impact. Today, we're going to be focusing on one of the largest elements within that, uh, your roads drainage. Uh, we're going to be discussing how they can be accounted for using geometric design software. Obviously, a lot of detail on the theoretical side. And uh, yeah, taking it in the software, looking at the design of culverts, uh, ditching, as well as your road surface. Now, Per all of our webinars, we will be demonstrating it using RoadEng, uh, but a lot of the concepts are universal. So, you know, no matter what design software you use, you know, please consider applying these concepts. Uh, it just might not be quite as easy. Um, we have spoken at length about our presenters' uh, backgrounds and experience that really makes them ideal for their roles. Uh, I am going to keep it really brief today, uh, and I would just like to say welcome, as well as thank you to Jeremy Araki, uh, Matthew Dickey, and to Brian Chow. You know, thank you for your contributions to this, to the content, uh, and thank you for yeah being here today. Now, as I said, an hour and a half action-packed of content. Uh, so I'm going to cover just a couple quick pieces of housekeeping. First, uh, everyone in this webinar is muted, uh, but that doesn't mean we don't want to hear from you. So at any time, you are welcome to anonymously type in a question. You can open that GoToWebinar panel and type it in. Uh, yeah, and we will get to those at the end, which may be an overtime. So with that, Jeremy, I am going to pass it over to you now, and uh, away we go. Thank you, Aaron. Hello again, everybody. Morning or afternoon. Um, I think uh, we've built a lot of background here up to this point in the first three webinars, and so today we're we're really honing in on on water, and um, we're going to try to tie all of these concepts back um, to the impacts on the environment. But it's going to probably get a lot more specific about kind of the what to's and how to's uh, because we know that that water is is one of our our bigger bigger impacts and and of course the, the that drain those drainage elements that we're going to speak to today start up at the road surface and that's you know the grade of the road shape the surfacing type so water flows off down onto the ditches and then how we move our water uh, through or past our road prism and we're going to talk a little bit about bridges. We we spoke a bit about it in the in the previous webinars, um, and we'll touch a little bit on it today. So I'm going to go through um, a lot of this theory, and instead of breaking up like we did last time, I'm going to go through all of that, and then Matt will come in at, at the end and show you how their software can uh, can help model some of these things. So I think we're going to start off here with just a a summary or recap of what we talked about before and remembering that if we're going to be building these roads we really need to think about the life cycle of the road and that starts from the planning stage right when we're talking about you know where the roads going to go what it's going to look like and that's you know proximity to the water the your road grades and and how the water is going to be impacted by the actual grade of the road the, the sufficient materials that you're going through and how you choose that. We spoke about that in the past. Um, but also, even more broadly, the, the parameters we spoke about in the previous se seminars, like users, design life, the seasonality of the road, the actual design vehicles, all of those things all play into how you, how you consider drainage and drainage design. And in the design, you know, we're going to talk about culvert stitching, surfacing and shape, like I said. And then on the construction side, how we manage those things, how we actually implement them properly. Um, and then over to use and maintenance, um, not only how we use and ma maintain that, but 
how the planning at the start of that and kind of understanding your maintenance program or lack thereof or how much you're going to be doing for inspections, that will impact your planning and, and then how you're going to maintain those structures. And of course, on to deactivation. Um, one of the more important pieces of deactivation is how you deal with water. So we're going to try to touch on um, all of those things, or you need to remember all of those things. We're not going to go through deactivation again today. So what do we know about water? Well, the things that we spoke about before. It's that interception, accumulation, and redirection, very briefly. We know those things are going to happen with every road, and our job here is to minimize them because as, when we do those things, we increase water volume, with, and that's depth, amount of flow, giving it more power. Also, the more power is, comes from the velocity, so we're speeding that water up, and all of those things being greater uh, erosion uh, potential. Now, how do we do, one of the best ways to do those things is try to maintain natural or, or pre-development drainage patterns. So that those concepts are we need to bring through this whole uh, this whole webinar here. So again, as a recap, how does water flow? What are the important things to remember? Well, on a hillside, water flows down the hill, and uh, the velocities are different. Remember, uh, surface water flows much faster as it infiltrates. It infiltrates down through the the, the soil horizons uh, to an aquaclude or to bedrock. And, and as it does that, it slows down significantly, orders of magnitude and velocity, but it also may concentrate on layers such as, you know, a till layer, a clay layer, or, or bedrock. And uh, although that surface water is, is fast um, and faster than, than the subsurface flow, it's not as fast as when you cut into that hillside and build a road because it's now not going through the forest floor. So again, a, a quick summary, as soon as we cut a road in, we interrupt that surface flow through the forest floor, and we interrupt subsurface flows. So already, just by touching the ground, we've in intercepted water. Because we've intercepted it and, and brought it out of the ground, we've changed the velocity, so we've accumulated water. And then always, to some extent, we are redirecting it even the best drainage pattern or the best drainage network in a road will redirect water. So they all happen and we're just trying to minimize them. So we have to carefully consider that. That's at the cross-section level. Back at the landscape level, again, uh, that we spoke about last time, you have the hillside or flat area doesn't really matter. It starts raining, that water hits the ground, it disperses surface and subsurface. It concentrates into channels and those channels concentrate into larger channels as they head down the hill. And the important thing to remember about this is that all of these features have developed over time to handle that flow volume. And that's right from the landscape level, and, you know, as the vegetation that can grow on it, right down to each particular channel um, with the velocity and, and the flow regime in that actual channel. So as soon as we touch those things, uh, we touched that hillside, we changed that. And again, quickly through a, a typical hillside where we climb up and, and do a switch back up the road, we've, we've cut off uh, that water surface and shallow subsurface. And in this case, as we're climbing, we hit, the, the road hits that upper, or the water hits that upper road and into the ditch or down the road surface. And in this case, remember, we talk, spoke about is uh, off the end of that switchback. So not only are we redirecting flow, we are moving it into a channel that has never seen flows from those areas before. So not only from the, the increased velocity and and the uh, redirection, we're actually redirecting into, or we have the possibility to redirect into different watersheds or micro-watersheds. Micro now, what does that look like? Well, there's in real life, it, it causes issues. There, in these couple of examples here um, where you can see slide activity off of switchbacks or off of corners. In the right one, it's, you, you know, your pretty standard uh, failure mechanism that you see all the time. If you don't let that water pass through the switchback, 
and stay in its its pattern, it could be concentrating quite a long long piece of ground flow um, right off the end of the switchback. In the photo on the right, in the same way, um, maybe not just the traditional switchbacks, but you have roads climbing up over top of uh, hills, and you can change the the direction of water flow even from one side of a hillside to another. So those things need to be considered right from the planning stage. So what do we try to do? Well, we put culverts in and uh, we, we install culverts to try to most closely maintain those natural drainage patterns and not just in the streams, but we also know, um, remember that, that water is gonna be coming out of those banks in between the streams. And sometimes we wanna disperse those with cross trains um, in between the streams so we don't concentrate into channels too quickly at the slope. Um, now, these changes in the water, they they can impact a, a variety of things. Um, like I said, with, with the stream channels, it's not just about uh, the concentration of flow and, and the changes in peak flow, but there's other impacts uh, of water and other hazards. And just briefly, we can go over some of those, um, you know, standard erosion. We've got a picture there of a fill slope that just has water flowing over it. Uh, it doesn't even have to be erosion in your road prism, it's erosion wherever. Uh, along with that, almost always comes sediment. If we start concentrating those things um, into channels, we can start causing debris flows or floods. And remember, we spoke about that before. That's where we have uh, water and usually a bit of debris that we accumulate in the channel. A lot of times we also have a road prism in there that can be saturated. And as soon as that material gets uh, gets moving, remember that that volume of it and the composition having the dirt and the debris and it gives it way more erosive power and it's a bit of a self-propagating thing to get big quickly. That's in the in the channels, but even on open slopes, as we change the water regime or load up water or load up fill slopes in our roads with water, we can cause landslides. But it's not just on the steep ground. Uh, if we look at this disturbance area in the bottom left-hand corner there, when we have roads, and we'll talk about this a, a little bit later on, but we can we can have you know off-road or off-site impacts far greater than than the actual footprint of the road. And like I said in in the previous slide, there, no matter what, we are going to alter we're going to alter the flow regime in a channel because even if we get the same amount of water back into a channel. Once we've brought it to the surface, brought it down a ditch and into back into the into the creek, we will change the peak flow um, and and when that peaks out because the water's traveling faster. And that flow, we are changing the actual flow of the water. What can that do? Well, if we're not careful, it can weaken our road prism. And again, we'll speak about that uh, a little bit more in detail later on. So this is not just a a steep ground problem and I think it's worth worthwhile kind of looking at these more more gentle ground or high water table areas because it's not just about that intersecting and accumulating or redirecting we can restrict flow and we need to be conscious uh, we need to be conscious about that and it's true in all terrain but especially uh, true on flatter terrain now if we want to build a road across low-lying ground uh, with a high water table and we don't give enough thought to how that's going to impact water we can run into a lot of issues well, for example in this case um, the cheapest way to construct a road is is conventionally and that's digging a ditch and using that excavated materials to build up a road prism that you can drive on and so when you do that in areas of high water table your ditch is actually basically just a trench be, beside your road. And that's that's not good for a few reasons. We'll talk about some now and some later. But, um, you know, the model might look something like this next slide where we have standing water. And you can see in the photo there, this is exactly what happens if we build up fill over these flat areas and we just have um, standing water next to the road. Now, obviously, we want to move that water across the road prism to low, the low side, 
So, so then, so then we add culverts or a culvert. Well, we can add that culvert, but it, it doesn't necessarily do much for us on that flat ground. And we've given the water to build the ability to flow through the road, but it really has nowhere to go. And so then we design offtake ditches. And um, and assuming our road is a built of, of competent material, they'll probably improve the performance. Um, but we've already daylighted that water table. And, and we've altered that site's hydrology, and likely significantly. And just like we discussed, that surface water flow is much faster than the subsurface water flow. And so regardless of that, we've done that. So the most common way probably of, of crossing flat ground is in, in, in a fill only or overland construction. And that's where we build with fill or mostly fill in embankments uh, with that imported material. And, and we usually do this for both for drainage, but for road prison strength. So we import a better material that's sitting above, above the water table. But when we do that, we're building in, in these flatter areas with high water tables. What we're essentially doing is we're building a dam. And we need to be careful because we're not design, generally not designing our roads as dams. And so what do we do, obviously, is uh, we, put in, we put in a culvert. Now, so that, that gets our water across the road, but there's still some things there that you need to understand. So that crossing structure is going to restrict the flow, and, and it's, gonna, it's still going to create a pond, or it could still create a, a pond um, upstream, and it's obviously going to concentrate flows, even if you use multiple culverts, at, at the outlet. And this is where, so on the left-hand side, you'll see um, a picture of a culvert that where the water backs up behind, like in the simulation there. And, and so when you're sizing culverts in, in this way, just remember how, how you're sizing the culvert, because there's, there's a couple of ways, um, in, and these are inlet control situations. And generally, you know, for cost especially, we will design our culverts for flow volume only. So as in as in the photo there, or not the photo, the, the picture in the or the diagram in the bottom left, the higher the headwater depth in at the front of our culvert, the more flow that culvert will carry um, because it's, it, it gives you a bit of head in front of your in front of your culvert. So that's great for being able to downsize the culvert for a particular volume of design peak volume of flow. But the issue is, is that, well, you can see if you if you deepen the water there, you're ponding that water. Now that can do a bunch of different things um, with the flow characteristics. So, real world examples, um, it can look like these pictures. So you can see that you've changed the not only the the creek or the water itself, but even how vegetation acts. And so as you slow water down, you're not just flooding areas out above, you're drying other areas out, and you're also changing the, the natural flow of bed load through that system. That and the vegetation around it, how that vegetation falls in, and now you're starting to impact you know, aquatic creatures and that sort of thing. So we're not saying that you can't do this, the important thing to understand is to have all the stuff in the background and understand what the other impacts are like. And that might not just be right at the road. Another uh, picture of a real world example is, is even if we do the best job at building a road, keeping water flowing through it, um, maintaining the overall water balance in the long term, we're still changing how that water moves through the land. And that can have a significant impact on on the vegetation. In this case, it's in the photo. It's pretty easy to see the contrast in the growth rates from one side of the road to the other. So, what else does that do? Well, when we when we lift water up um, in, through, in, around our road prism, we're changing the we're changing the water table in the road itself. And, and that changes things um, like 
the behavior of our material. And that's, that's the strength of that material. So if you're in flat ground and you're building a road that you know is going to have water around it, you need to think about the characteristics of that soil in terms of pour water pressure. That is, if the water, if the soil is going to be saturated um, and you're going to have water above it, there's actually some pressure in that water. Just like when you dive down uh, in a lake, you can feel that pressure the deeper you go. That pressure uh, is the same in soil. And when it gets really high, it can start pushing the, pushing the soil particles apart and really weakening the soil. But even without that, as soon as you add soil or add water to soil, it, and fine grain soils, it starts, it starts impacting its strength. So you have to understand um, geotechnical concepts of, of your building materials like the, 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 the plastic or liquid limits, or understand um, whether you have ex expansive soils. And again, in, in fine-grained materials, uh, in, in colder climates or with varying climate, um, now we can start having frost heat, like you can see in the one photo there. I'm actually not sure if that's frost heat or not. but um, And that happens because um, you start, and it's generally worse in roads because you've cleared your road, so it, it's cold there. And it, inside your road prism, well, that ice, as that lens grows, and it actually does look like a like a lens that you pull out of your eye, um, uh, it will grow because it'll attract more water. It actually can draw water up from the water table and make these these lenses of ice, and and that's why you see um, like in cities in the springtime you'll see big potholes in the ground. Well, that's ice lenses that have grown, and and um, then when they melt, they push all the soil aside. Now you have this big void, and and so that can happen. Now, we'll talk about it a bit later, but that's not generally how potholes are formed in resource roads, um, but it can weaken the, the prism um, extensively. And I think I spoke about it last time, there was a question about peat and, and uh, road prisms and full fill. The other thing that you gotta consider with your material types is that fill slope that, that is coming off the sides because in, in, if you have a high water table, you're, that's, that, those soils will be weakened significantly in the shoulder seasons, especially as they melt in the spring. So that needs to be thought of. And, and uh, one of the things I don't think I mentioned uh, last time when we were talking about that building over peat or over bogs and these full fills is that there's a lot of, and I, I tried to touch on a few of them, but there's a lot of things going on there. And you really need to get the right specialist involved and, and when we're working up north, we have, you know, us, the, the guys who are designing the roads, we have even more specialized geotechnical, geotechnical engineers. And then we have these geocryologists, the guys who understand ice and understand the impacts of, of changing, changing the ground above some of these frozen soils. So really important to get the right people involved to understand how your road may impact, um, impact that ground. Um, so we're not just talking about, um, you know, a bit of maintenance work here. If we're not careful in the planning stage, we might end up having to rebuild or even relocate the road. And, and as soon as we do that, not only, you know, from the business side, are we going to be costing more money, you know, impacting operations, but if we're thinking about our, our footprint or, our, you know, buzzword carbon footprint, now we're rebuilding the road. We have a far bigger impact not just from the footprint of moving a road from one place to another if we have to relocate it, but actually building it. And of course that's wasting money. But there's other things in the next order, like the road closures. If you have to have road closures, that's gonna impact your business. Or even slower travel speeds and the increased maintenance costs or vehicle damage. And not only that, but the, the safety concerns, which can also cause envir environmental concerns. You know, we have bad roads, we have, increased chance of, of accidents, you, you know, a, a soft road prism and a, and a fuel truck gets uh, sucked onto a shoulder and uh, all of a sudden you've got a, a, spool, a, a fuel truck spill. So what do we do in these lowland areas? Like I said, while we, we try to maintain that, those drainage paths as close as possible. And um, so we use free draining material that's gonna drain well. Um, 
you know, it's it's highlighted in green in in the in the model there. We use additional culverts, and, and we kind of we usually call that like venting a road prism. You're trying to make that road prism as vented as possible, so so water can travel through it. And you know, our, our grades with road grades with shallow ditches and culverts to help prevent ponding on flat or near flat terrain. Sizing those culverts not to be uh, not to be so strongly inlet controlled, you know, sizing them instead of um, instead of sizing them to have a you know a higher head to to increase capacity, we size them based on channel width, for example, and you know reduced fill slope angles. But but again, considering that freeze thaw and cold weather cycles and our use in that is important. So just another example of of, of local drain is just you know what we usually try to do if, if we're if we're doing it in the planning stages is just avoid and as you can see in, in this slide the overall all location heavily influences the drainage if the orange is is built it, you know it's on a well-drained ridge and the green roads built you're in this low-lying areas um, and you're gonna have more water issues more crossings to deal with so that stuff that we're talking about we need to be thinking about that at the Right at the planning stage. So down to the down to the nitty gritty in, in the details. Um, just a quick summary: What are we talking about? Um, we're talking about the road prism. So we've got a ditch on the upstream, all uphill side, sometimes on both sides. We have our, our road prism itself with subgrade fill, some surfacing, your fill slopes or ditch slopes. And, and a crown or the slope of, a, of the, the cross slope of the top of our road. So those are the kind of the main concepts and we'll, we'll talk about how those things can be dealt with here as we go forward. So in this next example, you know, on, on the left-hand side, water's running down the surface of the road. You're, you're washing your gravel and fines. They might be going into a stream nearby. Actually, I think there is a stream there. Um, but on the right side, after this road has been rehabilitated, they've added some, some key features. That road geometry, they've crowned it. Um, the surfing, surfacing materials has been um, changed, and they've used better aggregates. We, we spoke about that in the last webinar. And uh, established proper ditch and, and added a cross-drain culvert to alleviate those flows or to break up those flows. Now, grading is probably one of the, the most important and probably least well done maintenance activities on a road. And, uh, and we really need to think about that <clears throat> when we're talking about grades, road width, surfacing type. And, and probably one of the things that we, other things that we most underdo on resource roads is compact um, because we can do all the grading we want if we still have water or if we still have a bit of softness in our surface um, just the smallest of ruts uh, will cause water to pond and i've seen uh, in the interior especially the use of bigger bigger roller compactors uh, more often but it certainly is underused and they're a relatively it's a relatively cheap option <clears throat> so we can see the the results of improperly shaped roads. Um, and in all cases, if, if water's not directed off the road, you're going to end up with ruts and potholes. Now, obviously, the material is going to govern that a bit. But um, remember, and I, I'm pretty sure I spoke about it before, potholes in most resource roads are generally not caused from ice lenses or frost heaves, they are caused from pumping. So water's not leaving the road quickly enough, whether it's in a small rut or, or a flat spot on the road. That water's sitting on the surface, the vehicle drives over it, it splashes. It moves the fines and the water out, the fines settle out, and the, the water falls back into the low spot. Every time you do that, that low spot gets lower, the amount of water it holds gets bigger, and it gets worse and worse and worse exponentially. 
So how do we manage water flows on our road surface? Well, we crown it or we slope it. So what does that look like? The basics are, uh, of the three that we see, are a, a standard crown, as in the, the right-hand side there, where we have a high point in the center of our road and, and water flows both in both directions. Now, generally, that is the most desirable because it gives the water the shortest distance before it's off the road. That's not always practical. So sometimes, or it's not, there's other reasons that we can't do it. So maybe we'll outslope the road or we'll inslope the world. And, and the insloping can be with or without a ditch. So um, insloping, um, if we inslope the road, there could be some other reasons. For example, if we have unstable ground below the road there and we don't want to, to load it up with water, um, we might inslope, inslope the road, put it in a ditch or just in the ground, get it away from that spot and then put it in a cross drain um, away from that spot. That could also be um, trying not to add sediment to a particular area. You might want to inslope to get the water away. In the same way, or I guess the opposite way, the if you outslope a road, you, you don't want to carry water at all away from where it's hitting the road. You just want it to get off and get down across the road as quickly as possible, then you would then you would use an outslope in a scenario. But it's not just that the cross-sectional shape that impacts. You have to remember that the road is is three-dimensional. So it's it's the grade of the road plus the the shape of the road in, in section. And that has well, it is the impact of how that water uh, will run off the road. So in this example here, you have a, you know, kind of a moderately sloping uh, road. And we're in these examples just to show uh, flow, we're just showing a, an outslope road. Well, you can see in the, the right-hand side there, the, those, those flow vectors of how, because you're on a grade, the water's not flowing directly across the road. It's flowing on an angle down the road. Now, as you change change things like road grade, that changes significantly. So in this next sign, that now we're on a much steeper portion of the road. Now that water is flowing more down the road than it is across the road. And so it's doing a few things. One, it takes a lot longer to get off your road prism. So the longer it takes off the to get off the road prism, the more chance it has to soften your surfacing, start concentrating, um, especially in in ruts, um, and 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 concentrating into into specific spaces. And then, obviously, when that happens, when you start getting deeper flows, higher volume flows, they have more erosive power, and now we can start eroding our road. So those two things in conjunction. Um, can really change the erosion potential and how it impacts your road surfacing. In the same way, when you're on a flat grade, the water has to leave uh, the road sideways um, based on crossfall only. And this has the same sort of challenges uh, because the water uh, is going to stay on the road and has way more potential to cause things like potholes like we described above. And if you're driving, next time you're driving down a resource road, I play this game because I think it's fun because I'm an engineer, you can predict uh, how many potholes and where you're going to hit the potholes because they will always exist in sags or crests or in flat grades. And along with that, uh, in wider spots where the grader has, uh, has widened the road out, and that's simply because the water is having trouble getting off the road. As soon as that water has trouble getting off the road, it's going to start making potholes. We're doing okay for time, I think. Um, so other things you can do to, to change how that water flows off is uh, you can roll your grades. Now, um, that breaks up at least uh, redirection of water, but it does cause issues with um, the water sitting on the road surface. So then crown or cross slope is far more important. Um, and, but it does split up 
how that flow goes. Now, um, the other thing that this does, and, and we mentioned it a bit uh, in one of the other seminars about crossing fans, and this is a really good picture to show how you would swale a road grade when you were crossing an alluvial fan. Because remember, when we build roads across fans, our main goal is try is to try to let that that fan follow its 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 pre or pre development processes. So it wants to spread water out around the fan sometimes as the channels evolve. And what we're trying to do, or we're trying to avoid doing when we build a road, is we're trying to avoid concentrating those flows. So um, in this example, the the road grade is swelled and it's actually also very low profile. So there's no big cuts or fills. So it's it's allowing that water as much as possible just to cross straight across the road. Excuse me. <clears throat> so surfacing material has a very large impact on the environment. And as we mentioned in, in episode three, once a road is has settled and, and you know the cut slopes and ditches have, have settled, it's often the primary source of sediment because it's the one that you're driving on all the time. So we're not going to spend a ton of time on this because we did talk a lot about gradation and type of surfacing previously. But you know, for example, on the left hand side, you've got a durable road surface in, on, a, on a logging haul, hauling road. And uh, even during heavy rains, it stays it stays stable. And you can notice in that left-hand picture that ditch water is clean. So it's not, even though the, the ditch water is right there, it's it's not, you're not getting that sediment off the side. And, and the right picture, um, that's actually a picture of a, a modified Ford where the water is designed to cross the road in, in times of high flows. And it's free of fines altogether. Um, because at you know at this location, like I said, um, the high flows are are designed to go over top of the road, and and there are fish a few hundred meters downslope in this particular example, and so we want to keep that that potent, potential sediment delivery um, at a minimum. Um, just as a as a quick side note, in the in the design of Fords, what we like to do this one has a a log bridge or a log culvert in it. Um, mostly they're done with heavy walled steel pipes, but we design our our venting or our low flow culverts in our Fords for the amount of rain or the amount of flow expected for when operations will be on. So here in BC, most areas have rainfall shutdown guidelines. That is, if it rains a certain amount, the uh, operations have to cease. So we want to make sure that there's a dry road all the way up until that point. And so crews and, and equipment can leave still being on a dry road. And then after that, the water will build up and flow over top of the road. But remember, servicing is not always required. And, and we need to think about that right from the planning, uh, right from when we're planning, because we have to understand the seasonality, the traffic volumes, the quality of the local material that we're building. and and in a lot of in a lot of cases, especially in in uh, temporary uh, resource roads, that that um, that superficial material, the in situ local excavated mat material, is just fine for for servicing. That's not to say that you shouldn't be considering that. It needs to be part of your planning and design process. So, like I said, <clears throat> grading is again probably the most important and the most underdone. Um, maintenance item. But one thing that we often ignore are shoulders and in resource road design. And I would say that, you know, 99 to 100% of the resource road designs that I have reviewed or used are done without shoulders. And 90 to 100% of the roads that I've built have shoulders. Um, and it's important to understand the difference. Um, when you say, for example, we need a five meter running surface, you need five meters of road that your design vehicle can track on. Now, in most cases, that design vehicle cannot track on the very edge of that road prism. 
on the very corner of the shoulder because the, the material is simply not strong enough there. So we design a shoulder. Now, those shoulders are important because if they're not done correctly, i.e. they have a berm, for example, that might impact how water uh, flows on a road. But it's also important for maintenance. And, and in, this, you know, in these pictures, it's a good reminder that if you're grading and you have surfacing material, which is often expensive, you need those road shoulders for storage and, and grading of your materials so you're not losing that surfacing material off the road. And when you don't design them, it often becomes part of the road anyways because the grader simply pushes it off the edge and then it ends up over time, as you add more surfacing and spend more money, it becomes part of your road, your road prism. But now the road is wider and water has hard, harder time getting off. Now we have more potential for potholes. Now also, we've never prepared that ground on the side of the road, and now it's part of our road prism. So now we have placed material on unstripped or weak soils, causing not just safety, potential safety issues for, um, you know, heavier trucks, especially during shoulder seasons when those materials can be weaker, um, but also for fill slope instability on steeper ground. Um, that's probably the most common failure we see, we see in older, older, older roads is the tension cracks on the outside because over the years, that material, the road keeps getting wider, the, the grader scrapes the road off, and, and that Fill, that surfacing material becomes fill material. Now, the other thing to consider, uh, and again, this is right from the planning stage from your use or, or mixed use, is whether or not you should be designing those slopes and your ditches um, with recoverable slopes. <clears throat> that is, so if you, if you drive on one, you can safely get off of it. But that's more about materials and budget and slopes or geometry, if that's going to allow you to do that. Um, now, ditching. We, we, we spent a bit of time before talking about ditches, but um, probably the, the most important thing is, is understanding where your ditches are going and what they're trying to do. Um, so understanding that as a, broad, as a broad example, you can then start getting down in the details. But you know, obviously you can see if you don't put any ditches in what happens or if your water goes to the wrong spot, what will happen. But we want water, we want ditches to move water along the edges of our road and get it away from the road to an appropriate spot. So we'll go, we're going to go through a bunch of details about ditches now. <clears throat> so right off the hot, um, we need to understand the dimensions and the, and the capacity of that ditch. That's the depth, width, and the slopes and the sides. So again, back to the planning side, what does that look like for use? In the top right example, uh, in a logging, uh, a logging setting, a lot of times ditches are going to end up with debris in them or decks of logs. So designing your ditches to still be able to handle that when, when uh, we know what's coming for debris or, or additions to the ditch is really important. Um, and, you know, on the right-hand side, obviously, that ditch is not capable of carrying all the flow. Um, and on the bottom side, you have ditches that have, that are the appropriate size and the appropriate material. But aside from just the capacity, you may want to consider maintenance. Um, slopes, obviously, or like I said before, that the grader can operate on, or even a width that you can run a, a, a dozer down if you have the freedom to do so. But when you're designing your ditches, also understanding and thinking about what your maintenance frequency, you know, needs to be or what you can make it and make sure that your ditches are sized appropriately for the amount of maintenance you're going to do. And, you know, if you can't make them big enough and you're not going to be back, maybe seasonal or permanent deactivation is the right way to go. And then understanding the you know, vegetation and, and how that impacts it. Um, we'll talk about that in a second, though. So 
how much it can carry, first thing you consider. And then next is where is it carrying it? Now, along the road, your, your ditches are carrying water, but the, the ditches don't need to carry water in the same direction or way that the road is graded. In this slide, you can see there's, there's actually three different lines here that we can consider. The top magenta line is the actual road grade, but we may have different grades, not only in our ditch with respect to the road, but between the ditches themselves. So in this case, the orange and the cyan ditch lines are the, are the ditches, are the, are the ditch bottoms. So in this case, as water flows off the road and into those ditches, we're actually concentrating the flow to our culverts. And that may or may not, in this case, doesn't, um, that doesn't match the, the ditch grade or the road grade at all. So that can be incredibly useful um, because we need to we need to really think about where that water is going and and what it's doing when it when it gets there. And and Matt will show you an example later on of how you can actually model that in the software. <clears throat> and what the ditch is made of uh, has a large impact on its performance and its environmental impact. In this case, which is clearly the same road, uh, on the left-hand side, you can see there was some, you know, that fine-grained soil that's underneath is, is highly erodible, and it's resulted in downcutting of the ditch. On, on the right, what happened is actually the, the gravel surfacing material that, uh, that was pushed over has actually armored the ditch, and in the same, same area, you have two very different, you have two very different performances of those ditches. So armoring is important. And armoring, um, when we say that, we often think of hard, but the armoring of ditches is not necessarily just a hard problem. <laughs> it can be vegetative, as on, we can protect our, our ditches with vegetation. And oftentimes, um, that's the only way we have in the long term to properly protect our ditches. So in the left hand or right hand picture there, uh, that's vegetated right down to the, basically down to the ditch bottom. Now, vegetation can be a blessing and a curse. Um, it it does the very best job at stopping sediment movement, um, but over time it will or can uh, reduce the capacity of your ditch as as the vegetation dies or builds up and and creates an organic mat in your ditch. But also remember from the from the metric we are the graph at the start, as water flows over vegetated ground, it flows much slower than it does on excavated ground. So again, thinking about that at the design stage when we're sizing our ditches. So berms. Um, berms, again, blessing and mostly a curse. Um, but they can be by design or by accident, I would say in, in most cases they are by accident, either because the road got rutted or the grader pushed a berm up on the outside edge because he didn't have enough shoulder to properly store that material. Um, but they're also added for safety, as in the, the right-hand picture on, in a mine, you need to have berms for, for safety. Um, but where... The issue with berms is if they're continuous and over grades, they uh, will divert and concentrate flows, and those flows will find a low point, and then they will break that berm in a road. So even when you have an intentional berm, as in the, the middle picture, if you don't have adequate breaks or armored breaks, um, you're going to have problems. So if you're designing with berms, remember those breaks are important, and it's not just for for water, but also in the winter time, if you are in a colder climate, with how you're going to deal with the snow. <clears throat> now, um, I'm not sure. I think Matt's going to have an example of this as well. The other th thing about not just changing the directions of your ditch with respect to the road, um, but also having double ditches. And again, sometimes these are by accident, um, but but they 
are a great tool if they're done properly and on purpose. And they, they work in, similarly to berms, but basically what you're doing is you're trying to separate your road surface runoff from the slope runoff that was intercepted by your ditch. And it may seem trivial right after construction when the cut slope hasn't been vegetated yet, and they both move dirty water, but over time, um, that water that's coming out of the slope is going to be clean, and you are going to have dirty water coming off your road surface. <clears throat> it's especially important or useful in, uh, in really sensitive areas or flat areas with dispersed flow that, that comes heavily out of the cut slope, like in flatter ground or areas of high water tables. Um, um, but anyway, um, it's not just uh, separating those flows, but again, as in the example above, you can you can put that water to different places. So your 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 ditch water can go to one culvert, and your um, secondary ditch, the stuff that's coming off the road surface, can go to a whole different culvert. So where are those culverts? Those are well, there are cross drain culverts, <clears throat> and as as in all culverts, we're trying to move water from one side to the other because if we don't. You know, we can have ponding or we can have, you know, big erosion problems. But <clears throat> what we really need to think about is how that water, where that water is going. Now, I'll, I'll, I'll get into a few more of the details. Um, but, you know, in, in, this, in this road segment, you know, if we have something that's imperfectly drained, um, we might need to be adding more armoring or we need to armor not just our our uh, our cut slopes or where the water is flowing, but but uh, where the water is coming from on weak banks. And in the right hand picture, that was considered and, and actually quite well done. So again, with with cross drain culverts, as as in with your stream culverts, we need to make sure they're the right size and. We need to size them for the expected peak flow, but we also need to size them for what is probably going to happen from with them. Now, cross-chain culverts, in my experience, are rarely or should be rarely designed for hydraulic capacity only um, because they are almost, well, by design, they are going to have debris, whether that is, you know, like in the bottom picture, a beaver, um, but in most cases, sediment, uh, either from your cut slope or from your ditch from the, and from the road surface, you're going to have sediment buildup. And so you need to consider that. Now, the top right-hand picture is a, is a watershed uh, is a watershed of a particular culvert. Now that's actually something that the software can do um, to pretty quickly estimate watershed area. And watershed area, there's a, a bunch of ways to to estimate hydrology, but almost all of them are the good ones will have something to do with the area. So I think uh, Dickie, Matt can show you that later on. <clears throat> but there's all sorts of other things you can do uh, when you're considering not just sediment, but debris. In the in the culvert on the bottom right, that that has a trash rack and an, an overflow culvert, um, and you can also put what we call debris aligners. So if you're on a bigger uh, culvert and you have a larger debris that's coming on, you can put a post in the middle, just an upstream, and that will take uh, sticks or logs and get them pointed um, parallel with the culvert, so they'll go through. Again. All of these things, it's super important to understand the, the maintenance implications and make sure that their design is going to match your use and maintenance and inspection and maintenance schedules so you don't have issues. <clears throat> so where do these culverts go? Well, one thing that we have to remember is our with our, our ditches and our culverts is understand where it's going. Uh, at first, so in the right left-hand example here, that's a fresh ditch that's flowing directly uh, with unvegetated material that's flowing directly into a stream. Um, so we do not 
want to do that. So we have to understand um, not only where our ditches are going, but where our culverts are going. And I'll speak to that in the next couple of slides. So the other bit of that is understanding in that positioning is, is making sure you're getting the length right. So in, in, that, in the photo on the right, uh, there's actually quite a big fill there. And so remembering that, that you need to design that pipe so it's long enough so it extends past the fill slopes. <clears throat> Grade is another important piece. Now, um, <laughs> a buried outlet, uh, you know, not like buried, probably not buried or buried during the install, but it was set at an inappropriate grade in the top left-hand picture, and flow was interrupted near the outlet, and that bed load deposition uh, happened, and it plugged the culvert. On the opposite side, if you have a hung outlet, um, you're going to have, a, have a, a fish passage issue, and, and that's going to cause uh, stream bottom erosion as well. So you need to have that culvert set at the appropriate grade during construction with an appropriate offtake ditch if it's not a, not a uh, stream, uh, so, you, so the water can move through and the sediment can move through. So it's very important to understand um, the long profile, not just at the road prism, but the long profile of either the stream or where the water is coming from and going to. And understanding the use of, of riprap and aprons, because you know that the culverts are always going to increase velocity. And so there will always be some erosion potential at the outlet. So again, the cover skew, your sumps and ditch blocks, all of these things are really important. So in the top picture, um, we have a, a culvert that looks pretty good, but um, it is almost at the road surface. So the cover on the culvert has to do with manufacturer specifications and, and how strong the culvert is, but it's basically impacted by the, the culvert type the backfill type, the um, surfacing, and the design load. But you also need to think about changes over the use with things like degradation from the grading or how far below the road surface the top of your culvert is so it doesn't get hooked by the grader um, and, and moved off. So you need to understand that material type. Uh, <clears throat> and the seasonality of your road, how your traffic's working, and, and the climate. Now, the, the graphic, not the photo, is, is, a, is a picture of, of, of how a, a cross-drain culvert would be put in with a ditch block and, and on a skew. Now, skew is so you're not changing the direction of the water as significantly, and that's even more important um, when the road is on a grade. So you the steeper the road grade, the, the sharper you should consider putting your culverts on a skew. That is an angle away from the perpendicular to the road. Now on the bottom left, you have a, a culvert with a sump. So that sump is generally used uh, in conjunction with a ditch block. So that ditch block is stopping water from, from bypassing that culvert and, and dispersing it there. But those, the, the sump is often a, a sediment trap. And so what these generally do is allow for some of that sustained material, like the fines, to settle out before it, it moves through the pipe. But there's a few things that need to be considered here. And, and one of them that I've kind of touched on in the last couple of slides is, is that point of discharge. Where is, that, where is that ditch or where is that culvert going? Now, let me try to frame this properly. If you are putting a culvert that in a spot where where you you don't have a lot of room for the fines to settle out before it hits something like a stream or something sensitive to, to sediment, then you need to have a sump on the inlet to try to settle out as much as possible. But before you do that, you should probably consider where that culvert is and get it to a place where where you can transport that sediment across. And have it have it room. So that's going to be, you know, considering the sensitivity of the ground, so train stability where you're actually putting that water, but also its its proximity to the stream or the sensitive area. 
because sumps are great, but they require maintenance. And maintenance may or may not happen. And even if you have a regular maintenance schedule, if you are trying to trap sediment on the uphill side of your road, it, that sediment may accumulate at a time when it's going to be where you don't even have time to clean it, and now you have a peak flow, and now you have an issue. So wherever you can, we want that we want that sediment to move to a place through our road prism or away from our road prism where it can settle out and let the the natural ground do its job of filtering it. So that understanding that with 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 respect to where you're putting your culvert and then how you're dealing with that sump is really important. And again, uh, understanding the use of, of ditch blocks and whether or not those are just to stop all the flow or whether they're they're meant as uh, as grade breaks or or vented ditch blocks to only allow some flow to go through is very important. I'm not going to capture all the points here because it's already 12. <laughs> I'm actually only a few minutes behind, which is pretty good. So uh, again, remember we're talking about um, environmental impacts, and, and I and I touched on it before a little bit about this long profile. But when we're when we have culverts in fish streams, and they're not appropriately placed, they cause barriers to fish passage. Now this is an example of an undersized culvert as a perched outlet that was changed over to an appropriately sized culvert. Now this particular scenario, that's not an arch, it is a culvert, and uh, so we call them embedded round simulated stream bed culverts. I think there's some more modern names for them, but the, the gist is, is that you size the culvert to be partially buried. We use 40% or 40 to 50%. And you fill that that uh, culvert with gravel either immediately or let the bed load flow in after. Um, and we try to match the the natural stream grader or bank full width with the culvert so we don't change the flow regime uh, or we change it as, as little as possible. And probably the most critical piece of this is, is getting that culvert at the right elevation. Um, because if it's not at the right elevation, that stream is going to go to its desired elevation anyways, and you could either end up with it, the culvert buried or with none of that bed load in it before. So if you're doing designs, um, the number that gets used here in British Columbia is 100 meters of channel upstream and downstream with, with acknowledgement of, of permanent and semi-permanent um, hard spots in the channel, so bedrock control, areas versus rock or boulder riffles versus logs in the creek that are changing that profile. Because remember, in the end, that water is trying to find one grade to flow down evenly. And so when we build these things, we need to match that. Now, one of the things we don't do anymore, and, and I had the crews out on a site this week uh, with an old fish, uh, fish improvement uh, culvert that was replacing an undersized culvert that had baffles in it. And, and for a few years, uh, we've been, we, we installed these culverts with baffles, um, hoping to slow the water down or trap bed load. But in fact, all it did was, was create step pools and wash bed load out. So we don't do that anymore. We try to let the bed load migrate down the channel um, as naturally as possible. So again, remember that long profile. And I'll try not to talk anymore. We could do a whole series on on just major culverts and, and only only touch the surface of it. Um, yeah. Okay, so armoring and protection. Um, usually we prefer to have our culverts like discharge into undisturbed ground, but it's not always possible or practical. Um, and 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 sometimes we have big fill slopes like in the top there. So we want to we need to armor that fill slope or, or erodible slope properly. The top left hand or right hand picture is uh, a picture I took last week, and um, and it's a it's a great example. It, it might be a little bit hard to see, but the that rock is is embedded into the ground. There's natural vegetation all around it, 
It's at a nice low slope, and it's actually really well graded because the gradation of armoring, that is the profile sizes like we talked about for surfacing, it's really important to have that variety of sizes of rock so it, it helps seal the ground up and reduce the velocity of the water that's flowing through that rock so it doesn't have any erosion potential. Now, um, the picture on the bottom left, it looks like a good picture, but I, I put the, the yellow question mark there because to me, that rock looks a little too big and it looks poorly or gap graded. So you see this on highways all the time where they armor culverts and they use like 50 or 100 class riprap. And all that happens is the water just hits those rocks, goes around it and erodes whatever soil they were trying to protect. So not only the gradation, but the size class of that, that rock is really important. And like all riprap, um, size matters and bigger and more is not always better. Um, okay. because if you have big blocky rocks, water has to go around it. As, well, as soon as water goes around something, it speeds up. As soon as water speeds up, it has erosion potential. So remember gradation. Now, if we don't have that rock or we have a really sensitive soil, then we can put flumes. The bottom right-hand picture is a, is a, is a outlet culvert that goes all the way to the bottom. That can be, that can be a half culvert as well. It doesn't matter, but it gets the water protected all the way to the bottom of the slope. Now, where does that go? We don't have time to fully cover crossings in our series, but um, again, we're only scratching the surface. But remember, when we have these crossings, they are, are in riparian areas. So avoidance is preferred. Your, your road drainage has the greatest potential to impact stream ecology um, where those two things meet. So it, it may be obvious as an encroachment, but less obvious is like a culvert over a stream where the, the greater berm funnels contaminated water into that stream. And, and it's not just the crossing, it's adjacency to water, as you can see in the left-hand picture there. In the right-hand picture, uh, this bridge is, is over a wetland, and, and, and we oversized the, the bridge, obviously, for that amount of water that flows through there. But that, that particular bridge is actually floating. It's floating on a mat of, of logs um, because that bog is meters deep. And, um, and, and the, that bridge is designed that it can carry a design load, but if you, if you sat a truck on that overnight, it would sink, not all the way, but it would, the bridge would go down. But in that case, that's overland construction with a floating bridge in the middle with the least amount of possible impact to that. To that. Uh, stream and wetland. So like I said, we we're going to touch on bridges just super quickly here. Um, I wanted to add this in because um, one of the things that we find as a real issue when, when folks are trying to size their own bridges is that the, the road center line and the creek center line are not the two only two things you need to consider when you're understanding how big of a bridge you need or what the approaches to that, that bridge crossing look like. Um, in this example, um, the, the software can actually model that the, how the fill comes in front of your bridge abutments. So that may be a really useful tool to understand where your, your, the footprint of your structure is actually going to be. Because as you're standing on the site, you have to think about things like the stream bank composition, where there are stumps or, or trees that will soon be stumps um, on, on or near that bank and how if you have to move that stump, you're gonna rip out a big chunk of the stream bank. And you also have to think about things like gating and how that the vegetation will degrade over time and weaken those banks when we're deciding how far back away um, we need to be. And remember, crossings are often the control points for where the road goes. Um, and, it's, it's not just, and it's not just a point location, it's about the approaches. So that proximity to the streams or parallel roads near streams or repairing areas, but also the grade, um, having our bridges at low points is concentrating flow nearer and nearer to a repairing area. <clears throat> Sorry. And like we you know, quickly discussed in the last seminar, you need to have the, the right professional to help you out. And 
And like I said, and we showed a slide last time, you can even consider, you know, integrating that ESC plan right into your, your crossing, that erosion sediment control plan. So we have to understand the channel hydraulics, deep flows, the subsurface material, the road approaches and the drainage. And we need to make sure we have a good bridge maintenance and inspection program, proper uh, grader training for how the grader operators are, are grading at or near our crossings and, and having the right servicing, um, even servicing on the bridge. Uh, we've gone with a few of our clients to to gravel overlays with splash guards on the sides in, in places where we really are trying to keep that salmon out of the stream, having the ability to grade right over and have the water even flow over like across the road or across the creek on the road and stay out of that, that stream is really important. But, um, and have those lower areas away from the bridge and, and remember to retain, either retain your fill slopes or understand the composition of your fill slopes so you're not generating sediment. And, you know, like in the right-hand picture there, as you're building, having the right structures and sediment erosion control procedures in place. <clears throat> other, other things to, to think about, just uh, kind of wrapping up here, is, um, and this is especially important, you know, just after construction, thinking about check dams, and that small temporary stone or, or small riprap dams they, that are constructed across the ditch to reduce velocity um, during peak flows and, and actually create some, some sediment storage capacity. And this practice is, you know, using these are, is, is a good replacement for the, the often misused, we see them all the time, the, the hay bales in the, or silt fences uh, as, as check dams in ditches that, you know, either never worked at all or, or failed right away. Um, but again, when, when, if you're going to design these structures um, and, and you're not expecting vegetation in the near, to regrow in the near future, they need maintenance. All of these things need to be maintained. So again, as in all of the other seminars, we need to consider water and consider how we're intercepting, accumulating, and redirecting. And we have to consider all of these things through all phases. And every successful project starts with good planning. And that planning considers the whole life cycle of the road, all of the things that we've talked about that need to be part of, of, of your road design process. Now, like I said before, um, some of these things can seem redundant uh, because we're doing this stuff all the time. But I think it's really important to, to stop and remember these small changes can come in and there's other things that, that we may need to think about. So spending a bit of time in the planning phase, just writing this stuff out, considering all the phases can help us avoid some real problems. So thanks very much for listening and spending these last four seminars with me. Matt, uh, please take over and, um, and uh, show hey. them how to do this in your software. Hey, uh, so I'll share my screen here and Turn my camera on. All right. Well, thanks, Jeremy. Um, and once again, I'll jump in with the software side of things. So there is a bunch of tools that we could show here. Um, and we can cover everything that we've covered uh, in the software, uh, but we don't have time to show everything. So we'll go over some basic functions. We'll talk about just uh, um, adding minor culverts and uh, cross drains. Uh, we'll talk about our cross section as it relates to drainage, so ditches dealing with our crown or whether we're sloping that road in or out instead of a crown. Um, talk about drainage area calculations. As far as kind of more advanced stuff, I'll, I'll go through um, designing an independent ditch profile. So that instance where you want to uh, have your road grade at one grade and your, your ditch grade at another. Um, I'll cover offtake ditches, uh, but things like uh, major culverts, so those embedded culverts for fish, fish passage, uh, designing your bridge abutments. Um, uh, I'm not going to show them, but there there are tools in, in the software for that. And if you stay tuned for future webinars, I'm sure we'll cover that in the future webinars or uh, just on our YouTube page for, for support videos. 
Um, yeah, and then there's a few minor items that I'm just not going to show, but there, it's largely a, a matter of just adapting one of the topics uh, and using it on something else. So instead of a ditch, maybe you add a, a berm component in there or um, add an armor component to, to armor your, your spill aprons. So with that, we'll jump into the, the software here and... We'll start with our inslope, outslope, and crown. So that cross-section behavior in the software is controlled in our, our template editor. So our default template is going to have a crown, and it's not going to be stored in the component. It's going to be uh, right in the template hold itself. Now, we could adjust that crown to be a different value if we like, but in this case, I'm gonna make an entirely new template and I'm gonna have it automatically in slope uh, depending on the aspect that I'm on. So for that, I'm gonna to go to our e-library. I'm gonna grab my roadway components and there's another resource road component here. So I can hit copy. I'll paste that in. I'll get rid of the, the old road components that I don't want to use. And we'll turn off our surfacing. In this case, it's a job where I don't need surfacing. I'll set my width to whatever I'd like and we'll hit OK. And I'll just copy that over and use it again on the other side. Now. The reason this is in sloping is in that uh, component, there's a parameter one to turn on out, slo out slope or a, a one to turn on in slope. So we can apply that. Nothing changes. We have to actually apply where that template's assigned. We'll do that in assign by range. And we can see that instead of a crown, that's going to in slope and automatically change based off of uh, our slope aspect for us. So that workflow can be adapted uh, for an out slope, and it's going to be largely the same, except I'm just going to change the uh, uh, that zero or a one. So it out slopes. I'm also going to remove my ditch in this case, where I want to move water uh, that we intercept across the road, and we'll apply that. And I'm not going to show it here, but if you didn't want to use this automatic uh, change depending on your, your hill aspect uh, functionality, um, you could override your uh, crossfall, or you could create a new template with, uh, instead of a, a negative number assigned on both sides for that crown, you could set a positive on one side. And if we watch the 3D, we'll see that that tips over in the other direction for us. On the low side, it's going one to the right, and on the high side, it's going to the left. Let's jump into the next one. Oh. So next, we have our ditches. And we'll keep it pretty straightforward to start here. In our default roadway component, we've got a, a ditch one and we can just tabularly change our values to, to suit whatever uh, we'd like. So we can change our depth, we can change our in-slope, out-slope, we can change our, our bottom width. And then aside from just these few parameters, there's more parameters if we hit advanced parameters. And I can add things like a back slope if I want that back slope to be set at a certain height and different from the uh, uh, cut slope. Now we can take it a step further and use a, create a double ditch. So again, I'm just going to use a, a previous template as our basis for this one. And here, my inside ditch is just collecting uh, surf, road surface runoff, so I'm going to make it smaller, smaller capacity. So I've got that back slope defined, and then I'm going to come into my e-library, and I'm just going to grab a link. So a link is a really basic component that's just going to be a, a fixed 
uh, fixed dimension. So in this case, it's separating the the two ditches, and then I'll just paste in that other ditch on the outside of that. And we could do it on the other side if we'd like. We could add parameters for whether that's included in cut fill, um, but it's it's pretty straightforward. And then if we want to do an armored ditch, uh, again we'll use our previous template as the uh, the basis. So copy and paste that. Name it something appropriate. And I'm going to get rid of these default ditches. I'm going to go on to our e-library. And I'm going to grab our, our ditch component. Now with this, it's pretty beefy there as is. Uh, so I'm going to change uh, different parameters to suit. So in this case, I'll change the thickness of my uh, armor. Um, as is, I've got the, the back slope extending up and I've told it to stop at the topo surface so it could double as a, a buttressed cut slope. Uh, but in this case, I just want to be the actual ditch that I have armored. And we can paste that over to the right. And I can pull that around in the template view to test it to see how it's going to behave. And right now I've got that uh, first armor leg appearing where I don't want it to. And there's, again, advanced parameters that I can turn on a switch, whether that's included if it's in fill or not. So once I'm happy with it, I'll hit OK. And once again, I'll go up to our assign by range and assign that template from the desired station to the desired station. And I'll only do it for the armored ditch in this case, but applying any templates the same, whether it's that double ditch or armored ditch. And there we are. And next we'll jump into an independent ditch. So this one is a little bit more involved for the workflow. Um, just before I hit play here, I'll, I'll set the stage a little bit. Uh, so in this case, I'm going to use it for a uh, road improvement. So it's an existing road that has drainage issues. Uh, it's a, a fictional example, but I'm going to assume I want to keep my uh, center line of the road at the same elevation. Now we could use the same workflow on a, uh, a new project. It would just be we'd be working with two different alignments, but the two are going to be linked. Um, and this application we're using it, the, the webinar is geared towards drainage, so that's what uh, we'll use it for here. But you could use the same uh, workflow and use that independent ditch as a means to uh, balance your cuts and fills if you wanted to use that as a, a linear borrow site. Borrow from your ditch, as is often done, to build up your road prism on the into fill. Of course, being cognizant of drainage. So this project, as stated, we're in a, a wet spot. Uh, we can't just trench that water through a wetland. We don't want to actually drain the wetland. We just want to improve uh, drainage uh, immediately adjacent to a road. So we're going to keep that ditch as uh, minimal as possible there, but we need an adequate uh, grade to move the water to where we'd like it to, to go. So, and my profile here is, is super exaggerated as well. We'll just turn on our template code so we can see the current ditch grade. And I'm also going to turn on a template code for my center line, so my finished grade. And we can see that it's using the default parameters. So the ditch grade is following our road grade. And here we've got those little humps and bumps that lead to ponding and poor drainage and uh, causing some of the issues we're dealing with here. So I'm going to create a new alignment and I'm just going to make it a duplicate of our existing. And now I'm going to go through and create a, a template that uses a reference feature. So again, I'm going to use the default as our starting point rather than just building something entirely from scratch.
and I'm going to bring in our, a couple special features here. So I'm going to get rid of the default ditch. I'm going to grab our ditch by vertical tie. And you can use this ditch by vertical tie to tie to another alignment. In this case, I'm going to not tie it to another alignment. I'm going to tie my center line to another alignment so I can adjust this and see uh, how my ditch changes uh, affect the surrounding terrain as I go. So I've set my depth to be zero. Make the same thing on the other side. And in the links folder, I'm going to grab a reference feature point code. I'm going to paste that in. I'm going to tie this to my first alignment. It's tied to my center line. And then I'm going to connect my roadway to that point code that we've just added in there. So now if I pull that up and down, I'm just changing the elevation of my ditch. So we'll do the same on the other side. And we'll apply that new template. And then we can keep our road grade where we have it. Or, and it's dynamic. We could go back and change it if we wanted to raise the road, for example. Um, but now we can move that down and our, our ditch is doing what we'd like. So going through the design process, we figure out where we want to actually put those that water. And we get the low points where we'd like them. And the nice thing about actually designing is we know what we're up against here as well. We can see we're, uh, we've got an excavation surplus of 25,000 cubic uh, meters of material that we have to trench. So the next thing, kind of building on that, is well, we've got these low spots. And in this case, it's very flat terrain. Well, we need to actually get the water away from our road. Um, it's... A ditch is pointless if it's just going to pull water and have nowhere to go. So we'll design an offtake ditch. So I've got my existing road that we've just designed the ditch for. I'm going to create a new horizontal alignment. And this is going to be just from scratch, start as a single point, and we'll design our offtake ditch to pull that water away from the road. Here I'm just going to add some uh, 3D settings so we can see what we're dealing with. So in this case I'm not going to reinvent the wheel. Ditch is just a uh, cut slope and a horizontal uh, bottom to it. So I'm going to use my roadway. I'm going to get rid of the surfacing, set my dimensions to be what I desire for my ditch dimensions. I'm going to use that. I'm going to set my cut slopes to be laid back a bit. And there we are. Now, of course, we need to assign that template that we've just created. And we'll move this over to that low point of the ditch. And now I can see I've got my surface from that other road appearing uh, in my design. Right now, my cuts and fills aren't, aren't going down to meet that trench. So I'm just going to rough this in first. Try and get my relief. You guys can't see it. Just uh, 
we'll expand the profile here so I can see that we're trending away, but when we actually take into account the depth of our ditch, include that in our merged surface, and I'll tell my profile that I actually want to see that other surface. And there we are. So I've got a very small grade, but that's probably the best I can do here, uh, given the uh, how flat the area is. And of course, I'm cognizant of where I'm actually ditching that away to. It's not a channel there, it's just a depression. It's nice and vegetated. Um, so I, I can be smart about what I'm doing. And here I'll just add a few curves, of course. Just going to smooth out the rendering and uh, make for a smoother path for water to travel. Um, yeah, and that's that's off take ditches. I think that's a really uh, kind of as Jeremy was saying, uh, creating uh, big maintenance issues. Actually, taking into consideration at the the planning and designing phase where you're going to daylight that water if you have ditches that are are below your surrounding terrain is is important. And then let's. Uh, Look at culverts. So we've got our culvert panel open here. We've got a, a design. So adding a pipe is just as simple as clicking add. We can choose the station where we place that. But we can also make a bunch of adjustments if, if needed. And in my 3D view, I can see where that pipe's been placed. So there's all sorts of parameters here that we can adjust. So right now it was automatically setting the length to daylight from inside to outside. We can change that to a fixed value if we'd like. We can change our skew. Uh, we can change our grade if we'd like. See, just a matter of toggling it. We can see in all the different views how things are behaving. Uh, if I want to perch that pipe in the prism, I can change my minimum fill depth from catchment point. And in properties here, I can change other things. So if I want to change my diam di uh, diameter, I can. I can also change the structure type in a drop down. So if you're dealing with something other than a round pipe, you can account for that. And I'll just change this back to a few things. And I'm going to add a template override right in the uh, culvert panel to add a change the depth, depth and width. So in this case, I'm adding a sump. Um, and we've got that. Of course, I need to turn on auto length for that to be an appropriate length. It's really easy to add culverts. Um, Another just kind of fairly unused feature that uh, is in the software that can make actually finding the uh, lowest spot in your ditch grade easier is in your labels. If you turn on your IPs at curves, you can add in a low station. So if your ditch grade is following your road grade, we can see that, okay, the lowest point there isn't 590, which I'm at, it's 585. So we can just change that to 585. Another feature in here is uh, auto spacing. So it's more useful if you're, you want to just vent the prism at set intervals. Uh, we can say space these pipes at 35 meters and put in eight of them. And rather than clicking the button a bunch of times, we can click it and voila. That's going to apply your default settings and you can change the defaults to, to be whatever you'd like. I've got mine set to be 500 mils in this case. And then, last thing that I'll show here is uh, our drainage area calculation. So this is a, a V10 feature. Um, so I've got this tin. I've shown the streams feature before. Uh, I've got a current point selected uh, on my model. It's a grid calculation, so I'll set the grid size and add a depression fill depth to get rid of any irregularities that I, I want to smooth out. And at the click of a button, I can calculate the drainage area to a point. 
So it does its thing, calculates. And there we are. So it's delineated the watershed for us. And to the right, we can see the feature properties of that currently selected feature. And we can say, OK, that's got a, a drainage area of 157 hectares. And with that, I've covered what I plan to show. Um, yeah, so thanks, as Jeremy said for his part, thanks everyone for sticking around with us for the uh, uh, presentation and throughout the series. Yeah, and thank you everybody. And I just wanted to first off pause and say thank you. Uh, and I'm gonna ask Brian, Brian, turn on your camera too. You were a huge part of this. Um, thank you to, to Jeremy, to Brian, to Matt, um, tremendous amount of work. I, I can't even begin to express it to those on the line. A uh, huge amount of work went into this presentation, uh, all four of them. So we're really, you know, appreciative that you're here, you're taking in the content. Uh, I do have a couple pieces of housekeeping and then uh, please uh, type in your questions. We've got a whole bunch of them to address. So question, uh, sorry, in my housekeeping, housekeeping item number one, you should be receiving an email following this presentation. For those of you here in the live version of the webinar, it's going to give you a video link to YouTube. Uh, and in particular, it's actually going to give you a link to our fourth version of our resources for the presentation, which actually is going to have a lot of content uh, in particular around fish passage um, and some of the stream crossing details. So stay tuned for that email. You'll get a link to the video as well as that important resource thing. And then we also have unofficial part five in the series. Um, we're going to be focusing, and that's in three weeks now from today, uh, focusing on how to take all of this design content and planning content and actually communicate it through to construction, uh, so completing that kind of final step. So with that, uh, there are a lot of questions. Uh, so yeah, please bear with us. I'm going to do my best to uh, hand them off to our team and, and we can go from there. So Jeremy, the first one's coming to you. Um, it's just, can you uh, recommend some reliable geochronologists that you've worked with in the past for permafrost regions? Or just speak to that in general. <laughs> um, I actually messaged that, that person uh, individually already. Um, but yeah, I would just say, make sure that you're working not only with that, that, that specialist, but couple that certainly with the geotechnical engineers and the geoscientists, because all of those things together um, give you a more fulsome picture of, of how to decide uh, what you're going to do in those ice regions. Excellent. And then the next one is also coming to you, Jeremy. Um, first off, they said great presentation. I totally agree. Um, that free draining subgrade fill that you referred to uh, should be built over something like geotextile, uh, drain rock. I think they're just looking to confirm that. Yeah, so overland construction, um, there's the, the things you need to consider when you're, when you're talking about that are uh, what material you're putting on, like what you're building that, that overland prism with. What uh, what the use is and seasonality and climate is like, the strength of the the material underneath, the sensitivity of it, um, and then the that interaction, how possible it is for things like migration to happen. So, um, for example, if you are in a, a super sensitive bog or permafrost area where you know as soon as you touch even the ground surface, the, the, the vegetation, you're going to cause an issue, then, um, then you, need to, you need to have some sort of interface layer on there that will disturb, disturb that at the very least. So consider things like a combination of, of geogrid, biaxial or triaxial, and non-woven geotextile. So, the, the non-woven geotextile is the material separator, and the grid is that strength bit. So the weaker the soil, 
the, the or the more or the finer grain or more you're going to have it has to do with water as well the ability of that soil to pump up into your or may migrate up into your free draining material the the more strength um, and the more careful you're going to have to be about construction uh, sequence you have to be but yeah non-woven geotextile for 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 material separation woven geotextile biaxial triaxial geogrids um, for strength depending on the subgrade and remember it's not just the subgrade strength uh, making that layer stronger underneath that will impact how much fill you have to put uh, over top to spread load appropriately so you know a strong triaxial for example may reduce your your required fill volume on top by say 50 percent or or decrease the strength requirement in that fill good okay moving along um matt the next two are kind of related to each other so i'm going to group them together and pass them to you um so the first question is you showed the ditch armor template earlier uh can you calculate the volume of riprap required and then the second question connected to this is does the software include armoring okay um so the um the first question is that volume is being calculated for you uh you'll have to just right click on it in the the hatched area in the uh, cross section and check which surfacing uh, layer it's being tabulated as and you can change which surfacing layer it's being tabulated as if uh, if you'd like uh, and then populate it in a volume table and you can see uh, how much rock you actually need um, is it in the software so that is uh, that uh, armored ditch component is in our version 10 library so if you're on support um, you can uh, get a beta version of 10 uh, and if you're not hang tight not too much longer and version 10 will be the, the current release excellent um okay uh jeremy this next one is coming to you uh how do you control the overflowing culvert from cutting the road i'm not sure what he means by that uh, question. I'll let you interpret it however you would like. Is it maybe the Ford? How to? Oh, oh, oh I see. Yeah, and if, if it's the Ford one, um, so we used to design all. If hopefully you're, we're answering the right question here. Um, the the we used to design Fords just with a, a rock running surface and and rip wrap along the edges to help control the flow. Um, but what we found now is that. Uh, basically all of our Fords we design with a hardening on the outside that's more linear so logs or steel beams and um, we found that to be the most successful logs are easiest because you can trim them to the right shape to get that U shape in your Ford and and it's really easy not to um, not to concentrate uh, the flows um, we often put a little bit of textile from the up uphill side of that that log underneath the about half of the road surfacing to help the migration of fines, stop the migration of fines, any fines that you have in your road surfacing. But we also have built a couple with steel beams on the outside. And some of them we've welded right to the tops of the of the heavy wall steel pipes to set that road grade. The the trick with water is it's always going to find the easiest path. So whenever you have it flowing over, especially if you're using riprap, it, it'll find that one spot and and a road right there. Okay. Um, thank you for that. And, and to that question asker, if we did not address your question properly, please, yeah, type something in the chat and let us know or re-ask your question and we're happy to tackle it. Um, Brian, I'm going to pass this next one over to you because uh, it sounds like one of those very complicated questions to answer. But uh, what methods do you suggest for calculating peak flow? And I think you might be muted. Still muted. Yeah, I think so. Uh, yeah. Do you know what? Why don't we? move to the next question and then we'll come back to you brian we'll see if we can figure out that audio snag um 
possibly a headset microphone setting. I'm not sure. Um, Jeremy, uh, what is the criteria for sizing the sediment ponds at the culvert inlet? Good. I'm actually glad that got brought up because uh, I did forget to mention one thing that I found over time is important to think about when you're putting sediment traps or sumps in. Um, I don't like to call them sumps often now, but um, one of the common practices is was to dig out a sump that was below the culvert invert um, because it gives you more capacity for, for sediment. But one of the things that we found that it can do is it can actually encourage water uh, through your road prism, right? Because you're already underneath the culvert and you got water sitting down there. And this can be especially pertinent in, uh, in construction and bedrock because you can't guarantee where that water is going once it hits a bench underneath and it could pop out elsewhere and i showed a, a picture uh in a full bench section that i mentioned that actually caused a landslide in one example but back to the actual question um one your anticipated maintenance schedule so how how often you think you're going to be cleaning that stuff out the sufficient materials so how erodible your stuff is how quickly you're going to get on or you expect things to revegetate and to have that sediment load slow down, um, the size of your culvert and the, uh, the, the um, consequence of that, that uh, sediment uh, um, pond filling up and then the sediment being delivered across the, through the culvert across the road as it fills up. And, and remember, the, I think the important bit that I was saying is that try to put your culverts in a place where that sediment has has room to settle out after you get it, like try to get it moving through your road prism so you don't have to maintain it. But um, sorry, and the again, uh, the competency of the of the of the shallow subsurface materials at the actual sump itself, because we find that especially when it's new, you'll get that raveling because you you have a locally larger cut slope because you've made a, a widening in your ditch. And so that almost always ravels, so accounting for that size as well. Excellent. Brian, do we have audio? No, no, no audio. Well, you know what, Brian did take a minute to write out the answer to our question on peak flows. And I know I am not going to do it justice reading his answer, but perhaps we can start there. But um, so methods for suggesting calculating peak flows. Um, basically, this, this could be a course, uh, which we're not offering to teach at this point in time. However, uh, common methods for determining uh, crossing design flow hydrology can include the rational formula approaches and regionalization. And depending on the information available, size of the watershed, location of the site, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you also need to consider, consider the context of climate change. Uh, see episode, uh, I believe it was two, uh, where we talked about that a little bit uh, for a longer return period design. Um, yeah, we'll also make sure we include some resources uh, as we can in, in our resource handout that you're welcome to look at. Okay, I am going to, oh my goodness, we are very over time. Thank you to everyone who has stayed with us an extra 18 minutes. Um, we do have a bunch more questions. Um, if you do need to drop off, please, you know, we don't feel bad. Um, we're going to, yeah, attempt to tackle a few more. Um, Matt, this one sounds like a software question. Um, how do you design a ditch block? All right. Um, I, I won't show it just for the, the sake of time, but um, something that I haven't shown throughout the series is just the ability to override your templates. So you don't have to necessarily build a new template that has no ditch or a, a shallower ditch. Um, you can just go into the software, assign by range, there's an override tab, and you can say, okay, from station X to station Y, I want my ditch depth to be zero, which gives you that, um, and place it in the right spot. So on the downstream end of your, your cross drain, and that can uh, model your, your ditch block for you. And you could use the same workflow to deal with the check dams and, and whatnot as well. There will be a video for that in uh, the next little while on our YouTube page. I should actually, I want to add to that. Um, all of these little how-to videos that we've included throughout 
the four parts here. We're actually going to be putting them all up onto YouTube, likely with some captioning um, and a little bit more explanation, probably slowed down a bit. So you are welcome to, yeah, check back over the coming month. Um, we should have, I believe there's like 25 videos that we've shown you. Uh, they'll all be up on our YouTube page so you can check them out and look for some specifics of how to. Uh, the next question is going to go back to Jeremy. Um, wheel rut is a common problem on gravel roads in the tropics. Uh, the in-crown slope of the carriageway will make the road slippery. How can we address the grip or problem wheel rut um, because it is so common on gravel roads? Um, and then they typed it twice. So, wheel rut, tropics, go. So it sounds like um, material is the problem uh, there. So um, I, I spoke about it a bit in, in the presentation is the underuse, I think, or I would say underuse of, of compaction early on. Um, so compacting that, that surfacing so you're getting the water off quickly. Um, the, the strength and gradation, obviously, of, and, and comp composition of, of that surfacing, Remember, there's there's always this trade-off. The blockier and larger your material is, the stronger it is, the less likely you're going to have problems with the, ver the lower the design speed. Um, and the other way, the finer it is, you could make a nice uh, flat surface or, or smooth surface, but uh, it tends not to deal well with water and, and, it, and it tends to soften quickly. So depending on what your limiting factors are, like let's say you do have only fine grain materials, um, you can consider additives uh, to strengthen the top of that uh, and, and, and roll that in with grading and then compact. Uh, we, there's a few of them that are used like for dust control or on, on uh, gravel airstrips uh, in the north that work pretty well uh, as an additive. Um, or just a stronger crown. Um, we often use 4%, not, not 2%. And then the grading procedure of how you hold that crown and move material back and forth. Because one of the things that's hard to do, especially on a wider road, is get a real high point in the middle. So you'll still often get that, that flat spot at the top that's holding water and softer. Um, but th that question's tough because I'm not sure exactly what the limiting factors are there. But really, it's surfacing strength and getting the water off of it. Can, can you guys hear me now? Oh, we can. Welcome. I'm back. Yeah, I just decided to add to what Jeremy said there. So the presence of where the water table is may have an impact. So if your water table is high, uh, your subgrade, which would you know, be the base supporting your surface, if it's wet, uh, it could be the reason why your road's punching out. So you want to make sure that your road prism is high and dry. So if you've got a high water table, that poses some problems and, and then you'll have to think of some other alternatives if you can't lower the water table. And Brian, while, while you've got the mic, do you want to add anything to that other question on calculating peak flow? No, I, but I, I was just kind of curious if Jeremy would want to add anything. Like the two basic approaches are uh, rational formula and then uh, a regionalization approach, both which require in the first uh, IDF curves and the second uh, flood flow data from gauging stations. Um, those are the two primary methods. Um, you know, speaking at a high level, but you know, they're uh, figuring on hydrology uh, and design flood hydrology. You know, that's that's a, a, a separate undertaking, a huge course in itself. Yeah, and, and making sure you're using the right method for the size of watershed. We we generally run all of them, um, unless unless there's something super obvious about not to do. But uh, I also like to do Mannings um, if you have a decent stretch of channel. But that's mostly uh, for uh, estimating velocity. So we we have we add that into the mix as well. Okay. Oh, so many questions still coming in. You guys are very uh, chatty today. Um, where are all these questions in webinar one? Um, 
Matt, I think this one's coming to you. Uh, how can we show um, in the software detailed culvert reinforcement? Uh, so I assume that's referring to like head walls. Um, if I'm wrong, feel free to correct me. Uh, one way would be to design a wall in your template. Um, kind of the more, probably the more appropriate thing would be to, uh, and we've added it in version 10, is to um, actually treat that feature. So if it's a, a precast culvert head wall, it's probably got set dimensions and dealing with it as part of your cross section likely isn't the most appropriate means to tackle it. Uh, so building an actual 3D object and placing that at the where you want it and uh, uh, designing accordingly is the probably the best way to go. It does become more involved, uh, really getting more into that major major uh, structure design era. Um, and yeah, didn't have the time to cover major structures in, in this series at all. Uh, but I believe we've done it in the past, and uh, there's some videos on our YouTube page, uh, and I'm sure we'll have uh, some videos in the near future that show that uh, 3D asset modeling uh, that's that's new in version 10. Excellent. Sorry, I didn't fully answer that with showing <laughs> you, it, but uh, it's an involved answer. Yeah, and to that question asker, I'm happy to send you a couple of the existing videos that we have up from our channel. Um, the next question is towards Jeremy. Uh, can you comment on the main advantages and disadvantages of flumes versus riprap uh, at culvert outflows, uh, specifically costs, velocity control, etc.? So availability of rock and the right kind of rock for sure, um, and but it's sensitivity of the ground underneath as well. Um, and then access. So I designed a flume last week on a road repair that had uh, some instability and landslide instability below the road. So we we're able to move the road onto stable ground, but um, and it's in a, it's in a gully and a crossing. So we didn't want to um, continue to load up that slope with water where it was still near the head wall and near some. Um, near some unstable structures that would have caused us more instability to get to by getting to them rather than just leaving them. So we flumed um, down about 30 meters, or we were going to, um, because we didn't want to touch the slope at all. And we couldn't physically get there without without causing a big issue. Say the, the th and, and then of course your availability of riprap is a big thing in the cost of, of getting it there. But the one thing of, I think it's worth mentioning again is that uh, wherever that's coming out, the same as with a culvert, and I think I might have got on a track and forgot to talk about aprons uh, down there back in the, in the talk, but at the bottom of that, the water's going to come out and it's coming out way faster than it normally would in that channel pre-road. Um, and so having something to take the energy out of that water is super important. We generally like to call those aprons because we put them at the grade of whatever the channel is uh, below and so at the same grade and at the same level so the water comes out of either the culvert or the or the flume or the or the oshu pipe um, it hits that that rock eats the flow and then it's it's sending itself uh, down at the right slope to match right into that existing uh, stream bottom material because of course remember the the, the stream bottom the bed load that's in that stream is naturally sized for the amount of energy that that stream has under normal flows. And as soon as we put a culvert or a crossing in, we change that energy, right? And so you have to try to eat that energy again and get it back going in the correct direction uh, before it touches that material uh, again, or else it will erode it. Same same concept as in when you're doing seawalls or, or riprap armoring on oceans or beaches, you're trying to, to eat that energy up because you've either changed a direction or, or the speed, so you're changing the velocity of, of the water, so you have to, to deal with that. But yeah, I would cost and access. Couple of comments to add. Um, typically, you're not gonna use the flumes on uh, stream flows, uh, mostly for cross drains. I suppose there'd be the odd case where you'll use it for a 
for an actual stream, but you, you know, they're not really intended for uh, lots of water to go through them because uh, you're, you're putting them on the slope, the same slope as uh, uh, whatever you're laying it over, and they tend to be really steep, which really accelerates the, the water, and you get a lot of erosive potential out of the bottom of it. Uh, so as Jeremy uh, has indicated, you, got, you need to consider that. Um, you don't often see open flumes uh, on resource roads in particular, which have a lot less maintenance than paved roads. And that's because they uh, have a tendency to bend and twist, especially if you're in snow country. Uh, so the, what you'll typically see is uh, closed flumes. And you know, more often uh, we're seeing the plastic pipe um, uh, uh, closed flumes. And uh, in snow country, um, they uh, can tend to get ripped off uh, from the culvert to which it's attached uh, due to snow load. So those are things you need to consider. And ice, they get damaged by ice from the shoulder flows as well? Okay, last question, because um, we are now really, really over time. So I just wanted to, before we do the last question, uh, one reiteration of our thank yous to, to our presenters and to Brian uh, for his contributions in the series. Uh, so the last question, and I believe it's coming to you as well, Jeremy, um, how can we stop our roads in the Caribou? So for those of you not in British Columbia, that's a region of our province um, here in Canada. Um, so how can we stop our roads in the Caribou from looking like washboards. Don't drive on them. Yeah, I love that question. Yeah, stop people in two-wheel drive vehicles. So, so there are a few things, though, all, all kidding aside. Um, so what happens with washboards is the wheels are turning. You, you start to get um, you start to get some bounce. As soon as that happens, just like in pumping of a of a pothole, the wheel spins a little bit. Whoop, it kicks a bit of gravel up onto a Onto the, onto the berm behind it, and pretty soon you end up with washboards. So that happens from wheels spinning, so people accelerating, so you see them on hills and in corners, um, you'll see them there. So people running into wheel drive makes it worse, uh, for sure. But the, the things that uh, you can do to avoid that, so one is your surfacing gradation. So that, that's, you're only able to have washboards when there's material, that is free and able to be kicked out of the divot and onto the hump. So properly graded surfacing, so it binds together properly. And how do you bind it together properly? When you've graded the road, stick a compactor on it. <laughs> and, uh, and, and you'll have it'll be more solid. And add some moisture. Yeah, moisture conditioning. Whatever you need to do to get, or, or you know, additives as well anything to harden up that surface because that's the action that you're trying to stop. Excellent. And with that, thank you all for joining us for our webinar series. If you've been with us from the start, that's like eight hours of content with the four of us. So thank you. Uh, and I hope everyone has a great rest of your day. All the additional questions will be followed up by email. Bye, everybody. Thanks, everyone. It's, thanks everyone. it's been fun. Thanks.